Anyway, so today I'm going to talk about the Queen's Gambit a little bit, since I think for for many people, especially starting out, it might be kind of a mysterious opening because you know really a lot of beginner chess books or courses don't really give it much thought. Okay, so before I go into this game, I'll just first open with what the Queen's Gambit is. So it's just C4. And there are really three sound ways to reply. So one of them is E6, and this is called the Queen's Gambit Decline. One of them is called the Slav, and it's C6. And the other way is just simply taking the pawn. That's just Queen's Gambit Accepted. Now you'll see Queen's Gambit Accepted, abbreviated QGA, or the Queen's Gambit Decline, abbreviated QGD. So if you hear people say that, or it's said in books, you'll know what they're talking about. Um, each, each has a drawback, right? So drawback of the Queen's Gambit Accepted is White's going to have to spend some time getting the pawn back, but you've also lost your center pawn, right? That's the main idea of the Queen's Gambit. Uh, the disadvantage of the Queen's Gambit Declined is that you immediately lock in your light squared bishop. So it's going to be tricky to get them developed. And the Slav is the other option. And the downside of this is that we don't use our C pawn to fight for the center like White's doing. But the, the advantage paired to the Queen's Gambit Declined is that our bishop is free to move outside the pawn chain before we lock it in. So each, each opening has their pluses and minuses. Now you will occasionally see other tries against the Queen's Gambit and the Jagoran is probably one of the sounder alternatives, although it's not popular at all. You're not going to see it much at the highest level. And it's just because it's risky. I mean, uh, you're going to end up with one center pawn against White's too. So it's just strategically very risky. But tactically, it's definitely playable. I mean, Carlson has played it, Ivan Chuck, and some others. Um, another one you might see played by Morris Evich is E5, which is the Alvin Counter Gambit. It's probably less sound than the previous four I've mentioned, but it's still possible, especially if you know what you're doing and your opponent doesn't. And there's some others. Uh, Knight F6 is possible, but it's basically a bad Grunfeld. Um, now, the Grunfeld defense, by the way, is, is this. And the difference in the Grunfeld is that after white takes and expands, black can save time by taking on c3. Now if we compare this to knight f6 and the queen's gambit, the problem for black is that black can't exchange that knight, so he's just going to lose time. So it is possible, but it's basically a clear white edge here. Okay, so what I'm going to concentrate on today is the Queen's Gambit Decline, since a lot of you play it, and it's, it's probably the simplest defense to the Queen's Gambit. One advantage of it is that Black's plan is really simple. You're going to get your king's side pieces out and get castled. So it's really principled. So to, to kind of kick off the Queen's Gambit Decline, I'm going to show you this classic game between Petrosian and Boba, I think it's Boba Tosov, or... I think it's missing a letter, but I mean, this guy was a grandmaster, but obviously not one you probably heard of. Okay, so let's take a look. Oh, I guess the move order was slightly different. Okay, so yeah, there are transpositions in chess. So it starts out as like a Queen's Indian kind of situation, but Black ends up playing d5 immediately. Okay. Now, I'll mention that white has, has played the opening a bit inaccurately by taking on d5 so early. And the reason it's bad is it allows black to develop this bishop early on. So that's not very accurate, and you'll find out why here. So white plays queen c2 to stop bishop f5, and that's exactly why Petrosian plays g6. So now he can play bishop f5. He's, he's not playing that so he can fianicate with the bishop, which is why you usually see that played, right? So the advantage for black now is white either wastes time moving the queen again, or he can block, but now black's able to exchange light squared bishops. Which is an achievement for black in this position. Does anybody know why? Because of this, because the king, the black king's on the light squared. No. Because so white's star squared bishop is done. Because white's star squared bishop is done, it's... It's blocked by all... It's a bad bishop. Exactly. Yeah. Most of black's pawns, especially center pawns, are on white squares. So trading it off is a nice achievement. And it's oftentimes hard finding a good place for that bishop anyway. So it's useful to get that traded off. 
Snow White's trying to be annoying and stop Black mm -hmm. from castling, but it turns out it's not that great because Black can be annoying too. Now Bishop G7 looks tempting to stop Black from permanently castling, but then after Rook G8, Bishop's going to be traded off. You can go to E5, but Black's going to get that Bishop. So White goes back, and now Black can castle. Now this is, this is an important point to make. The knight may look kind of strange on B6, but you'll see in a minute where Petrosian goes with it. And this is another common tactic in the Queen's Gambit declined, is when that bishop is exposed to an attack, we don't have to worry about losing a pawn on E4. And normally the knight's not on E5 when this happens, but you'll see it doesn't make a difference. So white just played the queen back. Now why can't white just win a pawn? Knight's uh, guarded, right? F6. Yeah, f6, right? The knight's pinned, so you're going to lose it for a pawn. So, uh, you know, unfortunately white can't win the pawn there. So that's why he goes back. And now his knight d6 move is important too. So we'll wait until the position's consolidated a little bit. Now we have an important moment here. So Petrosian has managed to get this knight to d6. So if you're playing the black side of the queen's game of the client, uh, that's, that's really important square for your knight. It's, it's basically the dream square for it. And the reason is that you simultaneously uh, inhibit white's queenside play and you also support your kingside activity. So your knight can jump to e4, f5 as appropriate, and you stop white's expansion on the queen side. Now I did kind of rush into this. Um, so this pawn structure you see, it's known as the Carlsbad pawn structure. And it doesn't actually just come up in the queen's gambit declined even. I'll, I'll show you an example later. And one of the main themes is that white in the structure will play for what's called the minority attack on the queen side. It's called a minority attack because white has two pawns, the black's three. But white advances anyway. What white would like to do is trade off both A and B pawns and leave black with a backwards pawn on C6. So if you just imagine the A and B pawns missing for both sides, black has that pawn on C6, which white can target with rooks on the C file or from A6 or something. So it'll be a weakness. So that's what white's dream is, to play a4, b4, b5, and take on c6, right? So that's white's idea, and that's why knight on d6 is important, because it, it discourages b5, right, by putting a clamp on that. So basically, uh, black has ended up with a good situation. Um, so let's see what Petrosian uses with this. So like I said, black's plan is to advance on the king side, since White's queenside play isn't going very well. And again, this is a good general rule of uh, your central pawns helping you guide where to play. So if you notice, black central pawns point to the king side, and he's playing over there. White central pawns point to the queen side. Mm -hmm. So g generally, he'd like to play over there. But like I said, this line on d6 makes it hard for white to get the play over there that he usually does. So black's slowly arranging a nice kingside attack on the king side. So black did sacrifice a pawn, but when you're attacking on that side of the board, open files are usually not a downside. You might notice white's queen running out of squares, by the way. Can't go to h2, g3 h5, g5, or f5, or d6, here, here, here. <laughs> of all the possible squares the queen can go, they're all covered except for f4. But that's not a, a very safe haven for long either. And now black to play and, and finish off here. Notice earlier I was talking about the limited number of squares the white queen has. So you can probably guess the kind of move you're going to try to make. Rook F5 or yeah. And turns out the queen is trapped. <laughs> In the middle of an open board. Not very often you see that. Yeah, so, so white just resigned here. 
basically White's problem this game was no queenside counterplay to match Black's activity on the king side. So next, I'm going to show a game that you're probably going to find eerily similar between Kasparov uh, and Portiche about uh, 20 years later. All right. So we have the exact same situation. It turns out White made the same kind of positional error this game too. So this time Kasparov takes a little bit different route with the knight to a6. The idea is he's intending maybe a possible knight before, so White stops it. But now the knight goes through c7. And just like Petrosian, g6 to support bishop f5. And we see the same 94 tactic. You'll see it come up again and again in these positions. Trading bishops wouldn't be a good idea because now the knight can't be taken and it can go back to d6 the next move. And this was actually an important moment. So uh, in order for Portiche to stop Kasparov from getting his knight to d6, he has to actually play bishop c7 here. Nice intermezzo. Then after taking back, black's still fine since he has a bishop against the knight, but at least white can try for the minority attack now. Because b5 will be something white can try to push through. But the problem after queen takes is that uh, Kasparov plays this nice move bishop d6, so now white can't take on c7. And after he takes, he played another nice finesse here. So what should black do? Yeah, exactly. So it's better than queen takes d6 because your queen would be on the square that your knight wants to be at. So this way the knight gets a d6 immediately. So again we have a very similar situation to that Petrosian game, right? And Gasparov takes advantage in a similar way. So first we play a6 to make sure white can't get in b5. And again we might start migrating on the king side. So white has managed to trade queens, but now Kasparov has a powerful move here. I feel like you want to play knight f5 at some point. Yeah, right idea, but right away we lose the g4 pawn then, right? So we got to take care of that. Wait, you just push g3? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, white has a big problem because this undermines e3, and once our rooks crash in, it's going to be oh, a bad yeah, situation for white. Yeah, so at this point, White's pretty much in a hopeless situation, so I'm not going to go over the rest. But I mean, I, I can briefly go through the moves. But White's just terribly passive here. Black has everything bearing down on e3. And with this tactic, he wins a pawn. And after that, it's it's more or less just Kasparov mopping up. Right? Yeah. So... Again, we see you know how, how nice it is when your knight's on d6 and you put an end to white's queenside counterplay, you just patiently advance on the, on the king side. And it's really hard for white to get counterplay after that. So from black's perspective, that's kind of the, the dream situation that you want. Okay. So any questions about this game? Okay. So before we go to the last game, I'll just talk about some lines of the queen's game to decline here. So as I mentioned, um, in those games, white took on d5 really early, and it's not really the most accurate way of going about it. So knight c3 is probably the most dangerous reply for black, and part of it has to do with that knight f6 right away gives white a dangerous option, and we're going to look at what happens if black allows that in the Anderson game, because part of the Anderson game we're going to look at. Um, so. Uh, a line that you'll see a lot of top gems play is, is bishop b7. And it's kind of a, a useful waiting move for black, basically. So black wants to wait and see what white does before playing knight f6. And actually what black is hoping for is knight f3, and then he can play knight f6 safely. And we'll, we'll see that knight f3 is actually some kind of commitment for white in that Kasparov game. So this is what black would hope for. 
Now against bishop e7, um, one of the more critical lines is for white to now take and then play bishop f4. And then white will play e3 and, and bishop d3 and, and maybe play knight e2 later. And there's some lines there. But uh, black's, black's doing OK here. We used to have a student at Audi who loved playing that, that line with bishop f4. Mm -hmm. And then he'd play like knight b5 to, to consolidate the attack <laughs> on c7. And if you didn't know how to defend it, it was super annoying. Yeah, that's. Usually knight b5 is not right. not a threat in these positions. I mean, just looking at this, I mean, black can almost do anything here. I mean, uh, even if you just play like h6, knight b5 is a nothing because of knight right. a6, right. right? So it shouldn't be a problem in these positions. Okay. Um, but assuming white plays main line, so after bishop b7, knight f3 is the most natural move here. And now knight f6. Already there's kind of a crossroads. So. Uh, white can play bishop g5, and that's one of the most popular moves. But white can also play bishop f4. And we still see this today, and it's, uh, if any of you saw that Nakamura Carlson game from the Singfeld Cup where Carlson was torturing Nakamura for so many moves, that was from this opening. And so it's, it's still a popular line today. Now, the downside of bishop f4 is that it doesn't really fight for the center, so let's black play c5. So after, say, castles e3, c5 is one of the most popular moves and it's effective for black because the bishop on f4 doesn't really target black center here as opposed to if white were to play bishop g5 here it makes c5 unplayable because when we take d5 hangs after we take on f6 right so it's not playable if we play bishop g5 but after bishop g5 there's a couple main lines so now h6 now, by the way, I'll, I'll mention, if you're going to play h6 against bishop g5, try to do it before you castle. Because if you castle here, then after e3 you play h6. White has some dangerous ideas by taking and then playing h4, followed by g4 and g5. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not winning for white, but I don't really see a point in allowing it. So instead of letting white attack like that, just play h6 before you get castle. So you just don't give white that option. Now after bishop back, um, castles, e3, you're at a crossroads. So you can play either knight e4, which leaves what's called a lasker. And this is usually more solid because you trade off a pair of minor pieces. The other option you have is, is b6, and this is called a tartakauer. And this is usually the more ambitious option and if, if you know too much about chess history, this was uh, featured in an important fischer spassky game where, of course, Fischer didn't get here by playing 1d4 because he never played that, right? He got here by playing the English and then transposed to this. Um, but the Tartakauer is an important option. And I'm showing you these, these variations. I'm not going to go into them too deeply, but uh, if you play the Queen's Gambit decline as black or if you play the white side of the Queen's Gambit, you should, this should be the start of your studies is these positions. You know, if you're white, you should study b6 and knight e4. You should be really familiar with that. I mean, these, these positions should be, you know, well known to you at the start. So this is something you should study if you play those. Especially if you're black, it's important to decide if you're going to play knight e4 or b6, right? Okay. So any questions about these lines? Okay. Now, in addition to just classical play, white also has the option of playing g3, which is called the Catalan. And these are really important setups. It's, it's really popular at the top level nowadays. And uh, although you can get a solid position, a lot of times you'll end up suffering. So it's important to study it. And there's really two main ways as black of playing against it. So you can either. Um, just play bishop b7, get castled, and you'll later take on c4. Or well, the other option is playing c6 and playing for like a slav type of position. So those are your two main ways of playing it. So just for example, say bishop b7, castle, castle. This is one big main line. So this is one really big important main line. Now the advantage for black is that 
he solved the problem of the dish on b7, which is one of his worst pieces, or on c8, sorry. Um, the downside is that uh, a lot of times black ends up in a bind because white will play against allowing black c5. For example, bishop d2, and then bishop a5. Black will play against black playing c5 here. And then after knight b6, maybe knight b2, followed by perhaps b4. So you can end up in a bind, you know you solve the problem with that last squared bishop. Now the other way of playing, like I said, is with a, a slop kind of setup. So you could play c6 here. And then usually you'll play b6, right? Because that bishop on c8 is still awful. And you'll come out to b7 or a6. And then your knight usually goes to d7, right? So that's, that's another possible way of handling these positions. Now the downside of that is, of course, you allow white more space. Although it's perfectly playable, it can be a little bit passive too. All right, so those are your two main options against the Catalan. So any questions there? What is white going to do with, with his dark squared bishop in, this, in, in, in these lines? That's a good question. So typically white will either play the bishop out to f4, or fianchetto it on b2. And sometimes white will even delay the development. So white may play knight d2 and e4, and then just wait and see later where to put the bishop. So it's kind of a matter of taste. Um, yeah. Previously, in the queen's game of decline, you didn't necessarily think the, the dark square bishop was well placed on f4. Is there something different in this pawn structure that makes it better placed on f4 in this opening? Uh, yeah, so the, the bishop coming out to f4, usually the main idea would be to just clear the way on um, the back rank for the rooks okay. to be connected. Um, the reason you usually don't play it on g5 is because black can move the knight out and exchange dark square bishops. So I guess uh, another difference between putting the bishop on g5 here as opposed to playing you know, knight f3, e3, knight c3 stuff is that if black were to challenge your bishop, you can't go back because it's trapped. So that's, that's the other reason it doesn't go to g5. Okay, any questions here? All right, let's take a look at that kasparov Anderson game that I was talking about. <coughs> Alright, so th this game really shows the dangers of allowing white to play the knight on e2 instead of f3. So white gets the bishop on g5 right away. Now one difference in this line is that since white hasn't wasted time on knight f3, it's harder for us to play bishop f5. So as we see here, if we play g6, then white can play bishop d3 right away. So you can't get that tempo on the queen. And here we see the main idea by putting the knight on e2 instead of f3. We're able to play our pawn there, which supports e4. And that'll give white a big, nice pawn center. And it turns out it's, it's not really easy for black to play against it. So now white has this beautiful pawn pair in the center. And although white's advantage is huge, it's, it's hard for black to get counterplay. Of course, black's problem is that if you play rook d6, then you get fork with e5. <coughs> I'm not spending too much time on the game. I'm just kind of flipping through it so you, you see what's going on. So white's ended up winning two pawns, and the game wasn't over soon after this. And yeah, we don't need to go over the rest. Yeah. White has the two extra passers on the queen side, right? So this is this is really what black fears in this line with allowing knight e2 as opposed to knight f3, is that white can play f3 and then e4, and you get the nice huge pawn center. And it's hard to get counterplay against that. So this is why you'll see a lot of GMs, again, against knight c3 here. You'll see a lot of them playing bishop b7. And this is to avoid allowing white to play 
bishop g5 and e3 without knight f3. Okay. All right, so I've, I've covered a lot of, of stuff here. So do you guys have any questions or anything seem weird? Oh, you certainly can. You mean on, on move two? Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it at all. Yeah, that's one of the, the three kind of sound options that I, I talked about at the beginning. Um, now, by the way, if you you can play this now, one important thing to remember is it what to do if White plays e4. And actually, before I do that, uh, a word of warning. So, if you take on c4, the idea is to not protect the pawn and try to keep your extra pawn forever. Unlike the king's gambit, it's not really a genuine pawn sacrifice. So after e3, b5, white can get the pawn back with a4. Now say you play c6, white can play b3, undermine your pawns. Now the reason you can't keep your pawn is that if you take, white takes on b5. And white gets the pawn back. And if instead of c6, you play a6, doesn't work either because there's this pin on the A file. So it's worth remembering is that if you play the Queen's getup accepted, don't call it with B5. It's the idea is not to keep the pawn. But after say E3, your idea is to play kind of like the Queen's Gambit decline and just develop quickly. So you'll play like Knight F6 and then E6 and then just develop really quickly. And you'll play C5. Whoops. And then Knight C6. And then you'll, you'll usually fee and kettle that bishop. Maybe a6 and b5, or a6 and b6, and bishop b7. So it's a very solid way of approaching the opening. You can definitely do it. Do be aware, though, that it can be dry, because like in this position, white can take on c5, and you have a very symmetrical situation. So it's not always the most dynamic of openings. So. So black can't really exploit control of the d-file? Oh, here? Not really. No. Especially since white has the extra tempo. Is trash an option? Yeah, so I, I actually didn't mention that. It's kind of like a subset of the Queen's Gambit decline. Um, personally, I don't recommend it, although it is playable. Um, there is a Grandmaster Repertoire series written on it by Jacob Agard. Um, I haven't looked at the book in depth, so the, the trash that he's talking about is c5. So instead of just playing to get castled immediately, black tries to fight for control over the center. Now the downside of the trash is that you're going to have to deal with isolated queen pawn positions. So when white ends up taking on c5, you'll end up with a pawn on d5 with no friends on the c or e files to defend it. But in exchange, you get open files on the C and E, and you usually have a lot of peace activity. So it's certainly an option. I mean, for example, knight f6, g3. You know, this is a big main line. And then, for example, something like this. And white will play for a blockade on d4, and black will usually try to get some activity on the king side. Maybe bishop e6, rook e8, queen d7, something like that. So this is another way of playing it too. Kasparov actually used to play this when he was younger, but he traded this in for the king's Indian later. I'm going to show a little semi-slav. Yeah, yeah. So the slav is actually my, my favorite way of playing against the queen's gambit. And it's just because the queen's gambit decline can be a little bit dry, and I... Even if I play solid, I like to be a bit more ambitious. Okay, now, for example, knight f3, knight f6. Now, this is an important position that occurs a lot in GM practice, and black has some main ways of playing here. So e6 is called the semi slav and this is a favorite of Anand and Shirov and Kasparov later played it in the end of his career, and it's a really fun opening. Another way of playing is just d take c4, which is the most, it's called the classical slav, and it's a really principal way of playing too. Uh, another way is, is a6, and this is called the Chebinenko slav, um, or you might just hear people, people call it the a6 slav too. That's another way of playing it. Or g6, which is called the Schlechter system, is another way you can play. 
So the slob is definitely, you got a lot of options. It's very flexible. But the semi-slob is a lot of fun, especially uh, with bishop g5. You've got several options here. You can play knight bd7, which is the Cambridge Springs. And, you know, it's still played today. Um, if you check out that game where uh, Carlson drew Kasparov when he was a kid, this was the opening that, that Carlson was playing against uh, Kasparov. And Carlson also used it in 2013 to beat Gelfond in an important game in the candidates uh, as, as black. That was another nice game. Um, so there's that. And then there's the famous uh, Botvinnik. You can take on c4 immediately. And this leads to some of the sharpest positions in chess because after e4, to defend c4, you play b5. And now we end up with this really complicated situation. So the knight's pin, so g5 is the only way not to lose a piece. Now after it takes, we have a really imbalanced situation. Black has a horde of queenside pawns, and white has a horde of kingside pawns. So you get these really complicated positions. Um, so if, if you crave complications in chess, this would be the opening for you. Okay. Now another way of playing the black side is just playing h6, which is called the Moscow. And white can just take, but then that gives black the two bishops. So one of the critical ways of playing is bishop h4, which is called the anti-Moscow gambit. And it's gambit because unlike the Botvinnik system, black just wins a pawn here. So it's a, it's a genuine pawn sacrifice here. But in exchange, black has all these weaknesses on both sides of the board. So that's also a really sharp position. So the semi-slav is a lot of fun. Okay, and then another you know, possible way of playing a semi-slav is just e3, which is a bit simpler because there's no pawn sacrifices or crazy complications going on. Uh, although, you know, if, you, if you've seen that uh, Anand Aronian game, it doesn't mean that black still doesn't have a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, okay. We covered that in our Anand lecture, by the way, on the YouTube channel. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful game. If you just Google Anand uh, Aronian from 2013, you'll, you'll get the game pretty easily. Yeah. What do you guys typically see when, you, when you're playing uh, the wider black side of E4? How do the games normally progress? What, what theory are your opponents throwing at you? You're throwing <laughs> <laughs> so you, you play D4, Stephen? Yeah. Do they, is D5 a common response? Yeah, it's like... At least 60%. It's more than minus 6. Okay, and you play the Queen's Gambit, right? Yeah. Good. What do they usually play? Just the Queen's Gambit declined or something? Most of them that I've played have played the slow. Oh, really? I'm pretty sure only Elm games. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so do they usually play something main line? Do you yeah. play Knight C3 or E3 here? I play Knight C3. Okay. And do they usually take on C4? Or do you face semi slav a lot? No, I won't play E6. So, yeah. Semi-Slav? Okay. Yeah, one thing I've noticed is that among a lot of, you know, class players between, you know, 1,200 and 2,000, a lot of them don't seem to know how to play semi-slav. Like after bishop g5, I see a lot of people just play bishop b7, which is just terribly passive. I don't know what you usually face. Do you play bishop g5? Yeah. Okay. So do you face the Moscow or Botvinnik or Cambridge Springs? I've seen Cambridge Springs twice. Okay. And everything else pretty much not really. Okay. Yeah, one, one nice thing is that if black just plays passively here like bishop e7, then white just gets a great game after e3. It's basically like a queen's gambit declined where black played c6 for no reason, right? Um, yeah, the Cambridge Springs, black has some active options. Um, you know, the idea of the Cambridge Springs is, is this queen a5 move in order to, you know, toy with the idea of knight e4. Do they usually play queen a5 after knight d7? Yeah, but then I've never played anybody who knows war theory after like knight d2. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, knight d2 is a critical move. Black basically needs a take on c4 to get the two bishops. Um, yeah, another way of playing uh, this position with white is, is not knight d2, but you can, you can take on d5. So that's, that's another way of handling it if you want something a little bit more complicated. The only, the only downside of knight d2 is that uh, the game gets a little bit slower. 
white, white ends up with more space and development, but black has the two bishops and, and no real weaknesses. So if, if you do something, want something more active, then you can consider c takes d instead of knight d2. Or another fun line, if you want to play the moron is white, is you can play for e3 and then queen c2. And then after bishop d6, you can play uh, g4, which is called a shear off variation. You know, if if black doesn't know what they're doing, they get blown away pretty easily. You know, it's it's very aggressive. The idea is that you get the pawn on g7 if, if black takes on g4, so you can get a lot of activity. Oh yeah, that could be nasty. Yeah, and and of course, if black doesn't take the pawn, then you play g5, and you you'll have a lot of control over the center. So that's a fun line if, if you want to play something different. 